Uh, my name is Michael Conahan, and it is with great pleasure and honour today that I'll be introducing Ron Manners. Um, as we learned from uh, last night and this afternoon uh, from Hans Hermann Hopper, uh, it's important to uh, start from the beginning, um, maybe not in such a lo logical manner, but more historically and on a personal note for Ron. Um, so yes, I'll begin. Uh, Ron was born in Kalgoorlie uh, in Western Australia to a family uh, that had a long association with the mining town. Uh, fourth generation prospector, Ron studied electrical uh, engineering at the Kalgoorlie School of Mines before he assumed management of the family mining and engineering business in 1955, uh, where he then proceeded to expand and diversify the company into what is now known as the Man West Group. Ron's libertarian historical beginnings hark back to a direct connection with Leonard E. Reed the founder of freedom and economic education in the United States. Uh, a relationship was formed, and Ron considers Landed his biggest influence. Uh, as a result of which, uh, Ron was later encouraged by uh, Leonard to, uh, who then encouraged him to establish the Mankell Economic uh, Education Foundation. Uh, between 1972 uh, and 1955, Ron floated several Australian mi listed mining companies, uh, as an entrepreneur, he and his many business ventures, not just in, my, in the mining sector, but through, uh, have been through many booms and bust cycles. Some have survived, some didn't, uh, but there have always been a lesson to learn and a tale to tell. Uh, Ron isn't exactly uh, the bureaucrat's best friend. <laughs> One such example uh, is his run-in with the Bureau, uh, Bureau of Consumer Affairs. Uh, who, as agents of the state ha often have a tendency to do, uh, they disregarded their own rules uh, and secretly recorded Mr Manners whilst he was under interrogation by two bureau officials over his unwillingness to fill in government forms. Uh, Ron has a brief stint in, uh, also had a brief stint in banking, uh, in particular uh, money laundering, which, <laughs> which harks back to more... Uh, to a more uh, properly so which is more properly associated with uh, trying to keep the legitimately earned returns from voluntary exchanges uh, out of the reach of, from a gang of thieves writ large, uh, who are parasitical by nature, have no valid claim to such things. Uh, Ron has also played a role in the creation of the Workers' Party, we, as we uh, greatly heard from last night, the panel. Uh, and he has uh, several great st stories to share, which you may, uh, regarding Prince Leonard from the Hutt River province in Western Australia or which is probably more accurately described, surrounded by Western Australia, uh, which is said to have seceded on the 21st of April 1970. Uh, I'd be interested to hear a bit more about that, possibly. Uh, Ron has also been awarded the Fellow of both the Australian uh, in the Australasian Institute of Mining and Metallurgy, Metallurgy sorry, uh, and the Australian Institute of Company of Directors. Uh, he, his contributions to industry in Australia uh, have been marked by several award, awards, including recently being elected the mining legend uh, at the 2005 Excellence in Mining uh, and Exploration Conference in Sydney, <coughs> recently awarded the Emeritus Chairman and Patron of the Australian Prospectors and Mining Hall of Fame. Uh, in 2010, he was appointed by the Board of Overseers for the Atlas Economic Research uh, Foundation in Washington, D.C. He's the author, author of several books uh, and a man, a man generous enough to have flown over the future of West Australia. Uh, everybody, please give a warm welcome to Ron Manners. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, you, missed, you missed the most important thing. I, every Wednesday night at the Exchange Hotel in Kalgoorlie, I played clarinet with a little jazz band. And that, and that, that made the rest of the week bearable. <laughs> so, so listen, folks, it's great to be here. I, um, uh, let me start at the beginning. Sitting in church, last Tuesday morning at one of my friend's funerals. He was 49 and uh, I was making a few notes on a piece of paper and it reminded me of my father, my late father, who I always remember on Sunday nights. He, um, he used to, in church, have a little note paper and make Lots of notes. At one stage I said, Dad, what's with the bit of paper? 
and he explained that uh, he was working out whether he could pay the staff and the creditors the following Thursday. <laughs> That's the sort of pressure and disciplines that people in business get used to. It's the sort of pressures that the people, the bureaucrats that try to run our lives have no idea of what we're talking about. It's what made me fully understand the words of Ayn Rand when I saw her write the following. <clears throat> what she said, when the producers of the world need a license to produce issued by the non-producers, then you will know the world is doomed. She foresaw exactly the status of our present civilization. Governments seek control over our lives and I learned to recognize the enemy the non-producers that seek to control every aspect of our lives, and they get a great de deal of pleasure out of it, and that is their job satisfaction. Uh, I know that they approach business people as they've approached me, and they've said it something like this, look, we have a new scheme, it's a new licensing arrangement we're bringing in for your trade or your profession, and if you pay us this protection money, we will protect you from competition from those others who don't pay that protection money. And they, sound, they make it sound very attractive to people in business, and we fall for it every time. But once they've got us, they've got us. More about that later. Now, I uh, learned from all that early brush with that we, we can never win the game by playing to their rules. Make up your own rules and stick with them and play by them. You and I have the right to, to make up these rules because we support ourselves and we have very little patience with their fraudulent uh, facade of uh, the way they tell us that yes we can take it easy we can live off the earnings of others and uh, we'll just cruise along and this will be a good life we um, we remember that there's always a huge cost involved in surrendering your own your own independence to um, to promises and uh, uh, the siren saw, uh, call like this Ayn Rand once said they can only do to you what you let them do to you. So again, uh, stick by your own rules. And what am I talking? What sort of, what do I mean when I say stick by our own rules? Well, here's an example. If you're faced with a tax audit and you get one of these regular letters from the tax department seeking answers to 20, they hit you with a letter, 20 detailed questions they ask and they give you 14 days to answer them. Now, the normal businessman, the obedient little businessman, he suspends his uh, creative activities so that he can answer these fully. It takes him days and days of work. And if he tries to send them a bill for his time, like, as I do, uh, he gets a letter from them saying that their invoice has no efficacy. That's a wonderful word and I've used that against them on many occasions. But, but you can't win the rule. This is what you must do. Reply immediately. Reply within 14 days because that's an offence if you don't reply in 14 days. They come and get you. Reply, but don't use their reference number on, the, on your reply. And don't refer to the date of their letter Give them 20 answers, but 20 answers to 20 entirely different questions. <laughs> You've complied with the law. <laughs> you will never go to jail. You've answered the letter within 14 days. And this is what will happen six months later. <laughs> 
a very timid soul from the Australian Taxation Office will ring and politely ask if you would mind sending them a copy of the letter to which you've replied. <laughs> then you let fly with all the venom and abuse that you've built up all over the years and you shriek at them. What sort of incompetence have you got back there? It's, it's people like them that cause you to lose confidence in the government, in the whole nation, in the whole apparatus, in the whole democratic apparatus. And they back off and they apologise. <laughs> and then you, while you're in mid-sentence, you press the button to so hang up on the phone and they think, they think they've hung up on you. <laughs> and, and they don't want to cop another lot like that, so another six months go by. <laughs> Anyway, the, um, I've spent 50 years really enjoying my relationship with the, with the bureaucracy and I'm usually terribly polite with a name like Manners. You learn to be very polite <laughs> to them. So, so it's helped me become a joyous libertarian, whereas it's much better to be a joyous libertarian than a, uh, a bitter revolutionary burn out the crust of a person. But I enjoy this and it's even doubly easy to be a, a, a joyous libertarian if you can do it at a profit. And this is, and please help me make a profit. I have still have got some copies of my book, <laughs> which really, really outlines uh, my adventures. It's called Heroic Misadventures. It started off being my own story, but I realised during the last 40 years, which I picked up 40 years because the previous book I, I'd written finished in, uh, oh, this is a wonderful, there's one copy left here. Be quick. Now, here it is. $70, we take cash, we take cash, credit cards, your mothers-in-law. Anyway. <laughs> so there we are. Now, I realised as I was coming to the end of the book, that it wasn't just me having uh, 40 years of misadventures, it was our beloved country, Australia. So I've subtitled the book, Australia, Four Decades, Full Circle. Because I realised we've come 40 years, full circle. At the, end, at the early 70s, Australia had emerged from a period of extreme prosperity, where everything was going very well, then we ran aground, and it was called the Whitlam government, and that ground the hell out of us. We're back there again. We've come through a period of extreme prosperity, and we've lost it all. The country is in extreme despair, and this, this worries me. So that's, that's really, the book's a bit more about Australia than about me, but there's a few little funny incidents in there about the pioneering money laundering, as you say, and I was the chief economic advisor for one of the leading madams in Australia, and I helped her with advice on zoning. But that's, you know, if, if we're having if we're having a drink session, let me let me tell you some about the some of the some of the uh, successes I had for Mona, the madam. <coughs> now, to be joyous, I said that. Uh, it helps to be one step ahead of the no-hopers and to do it all at a profit. You must learn to do things at a profit because I know that money is not the measure of a person and it's wrong to ever measure a person by dollar signs and that's done by people that write headlines and papers. Never mention measure a person by dollar signs but without money you can't achieve much. You can't indulge your passions. You can't do the things you really love. So it's terribly important to have a few dollars to back you and give you a little confidence in, your, in yourself. Now, one of the inspirational figures uh, who got me started, and it is reflected in some of the themes in the book, was a fellow called Harry Brown, who, um, who was mentioned by Mark Tier last night. Uh, Harry. Brown um, wrote a wonderful book. I didn't bring the book, I brought it because I'm travelling light, I just brought the front cover. His book that impressed me was How I Found Freedom in an Unfree World. A wonderful theme uh, that you don't have to change the world, you just accommodate yourself 
and move blithely through the world, untouched by the bureaucracy, coming out at the end totally unscathed. And uh, it's equivalent to living in a free world, but you don't have to sacrifice yourself to do it. Harry Brown I got to know very well. I used to spend time with him in Zurich, uh, where he spent a lot of, uh, he lived uh, in Zurich for quite a few years. He was, at one stage, he was the American libertarian candidate for the presidency, and he was also, back in the 80s, uh, one of the hard money, sound money, uh, gold gurus who used to travel the world lecturing on, on hard money. And he said to me one day, he said, Ron, he said, people keep asking me this question. He said, they keep asking me which is the best country in the world. And I said, well, that's a good question. What's the answer? He said, that's a stupid, a stupid question. He said, there really are three questions. First, what is the best country in the world in which to live? Second, the best country in the world in which to work? And the third question is the best country in the world in which to invest? And he said, only have there been brief moments where the answer may have been the same for the three questions. But he said, if you're fortunate enough to work with your mind and not so much with your hands, you can have the best of each world. Now, when I say work with your hands, my, my, my great mate Jeff McNeil is a dentist. Now, you, you couldn't have taken advantage of this advice from Harry Brown because you had to be working where your hands were on your dental practice. Now, a lot of us work with our minds. You can choose the best country and you can live there. And you can choose the best country in which to work, which is where you do your invoicing and the best country in which to invest, which is often a different country again. And I thought Harry, Harry was very good at, at sorting things out. So that saves you being bitter. You can just move around the world and cherry pick. Take it as it comes. Now, so I wrote a, I wrote a book about my adventures. Uh, what did I call it? Here, here it is. I didn't bring the whole fat book. I started off being called taxation manners. Uh, then it became uh, help starving a f help starve a feeding bureaucrat, but it got shortened to tax whack. And it was a pretty decent book. The introductory poem in it was from Sir Alan Patrick Herbert, and I'll read the poem. The poem said, "Well, fancy giving money to the government. Might as well put it down the drain. Fancy giving money to the government. Nobody will ever see the stuff again." Well, they've no idea what money's for. Ten to one, they'll start another war. I've heard a lot of silly things, but la, fancy giving money to the government. <laughs> and the contents... <laughs> the contents covered chapters of ordinary people and tax resistance. How did government get control? tax revolt or tax resistance, economic reasons for tax resistance, moral reasons for tax resistance, tax resistance on a limited budget, <laughs> uh, th <laughs> th things that won't work to save other people going up some of those blind alleys that I'd found myself in, things that might work, <laughs> please try it so I can learn from your experience, <laughs> and things that will work. Now, I... I read that, I read that, pulled it out and I had a look at it last year and I said, magnificent, let's, let's print it and get it out to the public. My lawyer and trustee said, Ron, he said, if you print that, you can find another lawyer and you can find somebody else to look after your stuff when you're gone, but he said, you cannot print anything like that anymore. They've brought in laws that say that the minute you put something in writing, you hold yourself up to be an expert. And if anyone takes that advice, which was early 1980s advice, if anyone goes and does what I got away with today, and they go to jail, their defence is that they simply picked up this expert's book and they took the advice. I go to jail with them. I am linked with them inseparably under the law. I go to jail and as my lawyer said, and what's worse, he's my lawyer. He goes to jail with me and so does my accountant. We'll all have a lot of fun in jail. But these, this, 
This is equivalent to governments burning books, as they used to do. This is where we found ourselves. It's very serious. I worry. I worry about these things. I'll, I'll have to do it. My other, my non diploma is H.J. Van Groenwogel, and uh, Viv was just saying he. he, he, he <laughs> I won't tell you why I had to have another name. <laughs> but, but anyway, that's, that's what we've come to. This is a very serious thing, and I, I'm, I'm, I'm glad the guys like you are, are on our side, and you can, you can save the country from all this, all this sort of stuff. <coughs> I don't think anyone, unless they've been involved in the front line dealing with the, the enemy as I have done, I don't think anyone would really understand the powers and the pressures that they can bring to bear on an individual or a business or a, or a government. And I discussed this, we had as a guest in Perth recently, we had uh, President Vaslav Klaus from the Czech Republic. Uh, he fortunately kept the Czech Republic out of the European currency, and wasn't that a smart move? But he was under a huge amount of pressure to involve themselves in the, in, the, in the Euro currency. He was the last European nation to sign the Lisbon Treaty, under intense pressure, a long, long after anyone, everyone else had signed it. And I said, well, what made you sign it in the end? And he described the incredible pressures, the trade embargoes that Brussels and the other countries brought to bear. They would stop this business from being licensed in another country, stop this thing, stop this from being imported. Just the mafia. It's just unbelievable pressure. And in the end, he said, for the sake of his country, he had to sign that treaty, although it was absolute crap from beginning to end. Uh, and they're the pressures. Now, when they bring pressures to you, you might be in business, they can actually cut off your suppliers. They can prevent you from, uh, from having, if you're in the motor vehicle de dealers thing, they can prevent you from having a, uh, what they call a floor plan that defers the payment of, of tax, uh, luxury taxes and things on cars until after they're sold, you've got to pay them up front and pay cash. The pressures they can bring to bear are absolutely un uh, unbelievable. They have a vision and I, uh, that they just have a vision of us all being sh sheep with a little numbered tag hanging on our ear and, uh, and paying our taxes on time and, and complying completely. I, um, I don't know whether we've got a chance of ever revolting. I know I studied a revolt and I was fortunate to be the keynote speaker in 2004 at the uh, 150th anniversary of the Eureka Stockade in Ballarat and they asked, I think they asked John Howard to be the speaker but he wouldn't because he said the flag has been stolen by the unions and for him to be there would would give credibility to the, to the flag. Then they asked me because my great grandfather had some trouble with the authorities back at the actual Eureka Stockade and they thought there might be some family link there. So I, uh, I was delighted to speak and I spoke on the theme, will we see another revolt? 150 years ago we had a revolt plus, uh, plus uh, seven years and there's been no sign of any revolt in Australia. We've got all these other revolutions, the spring revolts all around the Arab nations, no sign of a revolt here. Bring it on, please. <laughs> The, um, I mentioned uh, just briefly last night that, uh, that uh, it is possible for states or any state to secede from the Commonwealth. I know they say that the Commonwealth uh, Constitution has no mechanism in there whereby the states can secede, but they say that about the European uh, community. Uh, saying that they, the, the states can't, the, the various European countries can't, can't break away because the, their constitution doesn't give them a mechanism to break away. But the sheer laziness of the federal 
government and the rulers of this country has brought about a situation where it's this simple for any state to secede. For a start, the federal government and the tax department are too lazy to collect the taxes themselves. They've contracted that out on a slave labour basis to all the employers who must, by law, steal money from it, the pay packet of everyone that works with them and for them, and the employers have to assemble that money and account for it and send it on a regular monthly basis to Canberra. So all that has to happen for any state to secede is for the employers' organisations to write and say to all the employers, hey, maybe from the 1st of January, this is all you need to do. Keep collecting the taxes as you're doing because that's what you've got to do. If you don't collect the taxes, you've, you've got a problem. Keep collecting the taxes but send the money instead to the state capital, not to Canberra. So you're complying, you're collecting the taxes, and you're sending it to the state capital. All's well. All the states would be doing would be to cut out the middleman. And that's what we all do in, time, in difficult times. We cut out the middleman to make our own economies more viable. So by doing so, you would really starve Canberra. They would have to sort of auction Canberra off as a, as a village to maybe to the Aboriginal community or to uh, some worthy cause because they, would, they wouldn't have any way of paying the salaries there. So I think this is, a, this is not too hard. But if you, if you download that thing as individuals, we can almost secede ourselves by making out our own arrangements. So there is a chance, there is a chance for us to revolt. It takes a little bit more thought and tune it all up, but let's go. If we cut out the middleman, I'm sure the world will be, will be better for it. Now, I think in conclusion, I mentioned last night that, um, that, is, that the, you folk from the younger generation, which if I may call you that, um, are, are wising up to this fraud that's being perpetrated on us all, where we're being, the votes are being bought and, we, and the bills are being sent to you guys. And I think I described it last night that the, the votes of the, uh, of the brain dead are being bought and paid for uh, by the unborn. Um, this is not a new phenomenon because President Hoover back in 1929 made that famous quote. He said, blessed are the young for they will inherit the national debt. <laughs> so that's as upfront about the plans that the politicians have for you. And uh, I really haven't any idea why you should be accommodating uh, to help them in their plans for us. So really to conclude, uh, could you, you might wonder, is Ron an optimist? We, we heard last night, Hans didn't seem to be an optimist. I am an extreme optimist for two reasons. One is that I've seen the enemy and I've had a lot to do with the enemy and they are absolutely hopeless. <laughs> and the second reason is that I, I look at people like you, like this room full of fantastic people, high intelligence, ambition, and you're going to achieve. You're going to achieve the impossible. Get out there. That makes me optimistic. So thank you for fueling this spirit of optimism in my heart. Thank you.